So um, it's my pleasure to welcome back David Swenson to the Kino Yoga podcast. Um, it's wonderful to have you again, David, and thanks for taking the time to come on again. I'm happy to be here, Adam. Always a pleasure. Great to see you. Um, so today, particularly, we want to talk about David's short forms that were, um, I think, the first introduction I had to this was in his book, the uh, seminal Ashtanga Yoga. I think it's called the Ashtanga Yoga Practice Manual. Um, around, was it, 97? You'll correct me on the date first released yes that i believe it was 97 ah i remember from last time i think um yeah so, excellent that was off to a good start anyway i've got a couple of facts right um so where, where did you get the idea to for the short forms and were you the first person to come up with them or did you take inspiration from somewhere else but Hobby joyce was the first one to create short forms people don't realize uh, that uh. He used to say minimum daily practice, three Surya Namaskara A, three Surya Namaskara B, and the final three postures of closing. So even he understood that people didn't have full time. Later it became this thing, and it might have been coming from students or you know, Western idea of you gotta do the full primary and uh, and and even when I came to yoga, of course, in the early days, we're like Labrador dogs, you know, we're just enthusiastic for the postures and more and more and at some point i wanted to i suppose give permission to people to have a shorter practice because mm. if if ashtanga is presented as it is all or nothing you can't say you practice ashtanga unless you do six days a week full full series every time or mm. it's it's not ashtanga i was like yeah but even patabi joyce wasn't like that you know, he had those, his minimum daily practice takes about 10 minutes. Yeah. And so um, I was like, well, there's got to be a way to present this. Obviously, one method to create a short form is to say, I have 30 minutes. Begin the practice, start through standing. When you have 25 minutes remaining, do the final three postures and lie down and rest. That's one way to do it. You'd probably get through standing in the final three. I was like, but maybe there's another way. So the short forms I created, I thought, well, what lengths of time would really be accessible to people? 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or 45 minutes? More than 45, you may as well just do half primary, something like that. So in devising them, I looked at the practice of Ashtanga, of, of primary series. And as you well know, Adam, these sequences are not a series of unrelated asanas. They're not a bunch of single asanas. They're families. They're little groupings. You have the pada family, pada angusta, pada hasta in standing, right? The trikona family, utita and parvrita. The parsvakona family. You have prasrita padottanasana A, B, C, D. So I'm like, well, I could move in a linear fashion through the sequence and just not do everything in a family, but you're addressing the family. So you're moving in a linear way and you eliminate some of those and suddenly you've cut the practice in half, but you're still moving in this way. So that was one, one thought. And you get to seated, you have the thing, same thing like Janu ABC, well, just do Janu A, right? And then, a, B, and C, if you eliminate the half lotus ones, you have A and C. And so you've got the forward fold and the twist and Navasana. Um, and I just chose like that, but I went in a linear way rather than just pull some from here and there. Because I believe there's an intelligence behind the arrangement of the sequences. Um, the 15 minute is just like a quick hit. I don't even remember specifically the asanas in it, but it's some sun salutations, a couple standing postures, maybe Navasana, the final three, boom, I've got 15 minutes. I want a quick duck and done. Um, and, and it's not only the length, but sometimes it's the quality. The 30 minute routine is a little slower moving. It's a slightly so, slower sequence. We can also save time by eliminating jump backs between sides in seated. So the 30 minute routine is moving in a linear fashion, um, a little bit slower. And then the 45 minute really is a great stepping stone for someone that wants to then do half primary. 
So that was my concept. You could take these and build upon them, and it gives you permission to understand that something is better than nothing. Mm. Because given the option of this is hardcore, you know, or strong is for the few and the strong and the proud and the brave, and you have to do all this sequence six days a week, or you know, you don't qualify. I'm like, but that's not yoga. More and more in recent years, it's just in my head that yoga is medicine. And just like the um, physician's code, physician, heal thyself. We should be the experts in our body to understand what dosage of medicine do I need today? Not what it was yesterday or 10 years ago or five years ago or whatever. What is the reality today? Yoga means deal with what's truly happening. Step on the mat. Wow, I only have this much time. I'm going to do this little bit. Great. Feel good about it. So when we then instill in the student that they have the right to use this sequence any way they want. Now, if I'm teaching something and I call it Ashtanga Yoga Primary Series, it is what it is. This is choreography. If you go to the Nutcracker Ballet, it's a full length ballet. You're going to see the whole thing. Or you go to see Romeo and Juliet, the curtain opens and everyone on stage is dead and there's an empty goblet. You'd be like, what happened? Right? Like, there's a story. There's a, there's, a, there's a choreography that happens and it's beautiful. And it's wonderful. And I think that the full sequences are great. So if I'm teaching that and we're calling it Ashtanga, then I stick with those. But if you notice, when I called them short forms, I did not use the word Ashtanga. Hmm. I just called them yoga short forms. Even though they're based on Ashtanga, I thought, well, out of respect for what this whole sequence is, I'll just use a different name. But I, I returned to the fact that Patabi Joyce made short forms. To my knowledge, in recent years, Sharat has come out with short forms routines as well. Yeah, so it, I, I think that it's healthy. It's a good idea. Um, Ashtanga Yoga system is arranged in such a way that eventually the student does not need a teacher. Because we learn a system, we learn the, the basic tenets of it. We have ujjayi breathing. We're understanding bandhas and flowing and vinyasa and moving. And at some point, once you, you learn these, like in a very specific, uh, specific manner, like learning a song, you're learning every chord and every note, and you're learning scales of music. At some point, it's okay. Just do your thing. Now, if I'm teaching a Mysore style class, which is traditional Ashtanga, I encourage people to stay with whatever the sequence is. If you have short, less time, do a few sun salutations, do the final three. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. What would be the argument then for start? Yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic. And there's so many questions like that actually lead off from here. I mean, first of all, you mentioned the idea of a 45 minute practice being basically, you may as well do half primary. Would there be an argument to instead of just doing half primary do say some primary and some intermediate and we call that a short form and in my mind that might be more effective in terms of balancing you know if one has the capacity to do so rather than just going every day because you've got 45 minutes just through a half primary you get more of a range of movements if you if you structure it differently i have no problem with that my only issue is if we're teaching Ashtanga, mm. whatever the class is called, that's what it should be. Because, because what's happening is I've had people come in to a Mysore class and they just start doing all kinds of stuff. And they say, I'm practicing Ashtanga. They do a little mm. primary, a little intermediate. They, do, they change the sequence. And I'm, no, I'm like, no, that's okay that you're doing that. But if you're doing this, Mysore class is meant for your traditional flow, your rhythm. You know, and, and I'm there to facilitate that in your own home. Do what you want. If you're a teacher, great. Just call it something else. And that's the beauty of power yoga, flow yoga, vinyasa flow yoga. That's what all of those things are. Mm. Because there was no such thing as a vinyasa before Ashtanga came to the West. 
there was no vinyasa sequencing. I was there. I was in America practicing yoga. It was only when I found Ashtanga did you see this linking of postures and these sequences. And many of the great our yoga and vinyasa flow teachers were all Ashtanga practitioners before. Brian Kest, power yoga came from Ashtanga. Um, Shiva Ray, Shiva Shakti flow was an Ashtanga practitioner. Um, Sean Korn, Ashtanga practitioner. Anna Forrest, Ashtanga yoga practitioner. All of these people liked the concept of a flow and a rhythm, but just as you're saying, they felt like, well, I want to mix it up. Some people like mm. um, Shiva Ray thought, I'll bring in music. Or um, Jiva Mukti Yoga, David Life and Sharon Gannon were major Ashtanga practitioners. They hosted Patabi Joyce in America. But they were like, I, I don't want to be stuck with these same sequences. We'll make new and unique sequences. We'll bring in music. We'll bring in spiritual practices and animal rights and other things we feel strongly about and, and spiritual practices. It's beautiful. I have no problem with that. It's only when so I call what are it the Ashtanga. Benefits then? What are the benefits then of sticking to the Ashtanga series as opposed to doing a short form there? What, what are the benefits or the intelligence of the sequence? Maybe you could speak a little to that. Have you ever done Tai Chi? Or do you know what, you know uh, what Tai Chi is, no, right? No, I plan, I say no, before getting into yoga, I actually planned always to go to Tai Chi instead, but the class clashed with something else at university. So I ended up doing yoga, but it, the plan was actually Tai Chi. Yeah, so I do know it, yeah. Well, yeah. You know what it is. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. In Tai Chi, you get one sequence of movements you do it the rest of your life. One sequence, a repeated sequence over and over and over your whole life. When I lived in Hong Kong, I would watch people in the park in the mornings, young and old, will go out and do their Tai Chi practice. And you would witness one person doing the sequence, same sequence. They've been doing it three years. And you're like, wow, that person is so graceful. Look how they move. I see someone else has been doing the same thing for 60 years. When I see them move, I'm like, oh, wow, it's a bird in flight. It's a tree bending in the breeze. There's something else they discovered. So the benefit of a repetitive practice is you can seek depth. Doesn't mean you won't find it in something else, but what happens, especially for the Western mind, we get bored. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll add a little music, I'll do this sequence, I'll do another sequence, I'll do the, and we, we risk just doing the postures we like. I'm flexible, so I'm just going to do, you know, flexible back things. And the handstand person will just create a whole routine that's nothing but handstands and become handstand machine. The repeated sequences force us to seek depth. The alchemists, have a saying, through repetition, the magic is forced to arise. That means through doing something again and again and again, you seek depth. Another way to imagine it is it's like a relationship. First coming to Ashtanga, it's like a new love, a new lover. You're just enthralled, like, oh, Ashtanga, I love you. I can't wait to see you on the mat in the morning, and I love this, and you're making progress, and everything's new, and yippee, and you move in together. And one day, you're like, Ashtanga, you keep leaving the toilet seat up every day. This is bugging me. And the stuff about Ashtanga that at first were enthralling and intriguing, now they bother you. And so you get a new relationship. I'm going to do power yoga. I'll do vinyasa flow yoga. You know, you know what I mean? Now, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with, with jumping around and doing different stuff. But the answer to your question is a benefit of repetition is the potential for greater depth. Mm. Yeah. What about the intelligence of the sequence? People often mention that you need to practice it in a certain order to get the benefit. Right? Well, and it builds up David, gradually. And also, I mean, just... Uh, I'm just going to say one thing and then and carry on. When you started it, as I understand, the backbend came at the end of intermediate. Is that correct? So you got a lot of backbends in before you started doing Urba Danyarasana. So is, is there any benefit well, in doing anything before that as well? Before you come to Urba Danyarasana? Well, that, that's a couple of different things. Yeah. So David Williams it. likes to say that the sequence is like a combination lock. You spin the numbers in the right order and it opens. 
if you look at primary series, in my opinion, it focuses on the larger muscle groups of the body, the big long muscles on the back of the legs and your back. And people say, well, there are very few or no back bends in primary series, but I don't see that at all. I say there are more back bends in primary series than any other sequence of Ashtanga because there are more jumping back vinyasas in primary than anywhere else. Every time we jump back requires an upward dog. I've never bothered to take the time to count them, but I suspect there's probably 50 or more up dogs, right? In a primary series, could be. An intermediate series does not have very many back bends. Count them. They're deeper, but outside of Kapotasana and Urvadhanarasana, where are the big back bends? Primary series, gets the spine moving. So you've got that up dog, down dog, up dog, down dog thing going on. So I think there's preparation for it. Um, the intelligence behind it, maybe it's just that I've done it so much, I have imposed upon it what I perceive to be intelligence because it just seems so familiar and starts to make sense when I look at the sequencing of it. Um, but there is this, this way that it works through the body. It's quite balanced because you've got twist, forward bending, backward bending, inversions. It's all there. Yeah. The thing that messes with our mind a little as Ashtanga practitioners is the names of the sequences. Primary, intermediate, advanced A, advanced B. I want to be advanced, man. I guess I can't be an advanced yogi unless I'm doing that, right? And so that creates this motivation that I got to move through these sequences and all that. But Anyone you talk to that's moved through all these things or deep into the practice is going to tell you at some point, it's all the same. It's not like you get through advanced series and suddenly the big questions of life are answered and your relationships are all working and you're not disturbed anymore. It's like, well, you know, you're sore. You smell a little like tiger bomb. You might limp a little bit outside of that. What's changing? Well, these sequences, the patterning of it, and this motivation keeps us coming back to the mat to practice. It's like toys for a child. You keep giving them toys, but they don't realize it, but it's educational toys. They're learning about shapes of a triangle and a square, and a, you know, as they're trying to put them in the thing and colors. It's a game, but they're learning. So in a way, all these asana sequences, they're games. And we're learning in the process later we realized, wow, it was never actually in the next asana. It wasn't the next asana I was hoping for. It's in the one I'm doing now. And once you realize that, they're all equal. Yeah, they're all equal in their potential for benefit, which gives rise to a natural question of Zen, why do them all? If you can find the juice without going so far, great. There's no hard and fast rule. And that's where I'm really a fan of this idea of its medicine. When I was younger, the dosage of medicine I needed to get stuff out of this yoga was full on practice, practice twice a day, push yourself through, go to your limit, find the edge, go a little further, get stronger. Rah. Yeah. Until I realized that my goal is to figure out rather than how much more time can I spend on the mat, how much less time can I spend on the mat and get the same juice? Hmm. Hmm. So short forms, that, that's the good segue to come back. In a, in a way, you realize, well, okay, this is medicine. And I can't tell you, Adam Keen, to take the same dosage of medicine as someone else or the same dosage of medicine you did 20 years ago, right? And so it's important. I believe that if we empower the students to take control and then do the practice in the way that they need to. And I know people, well, how do you yeah, figure out your own dosage? Sorry? Oh, how do you figure, you out, figure out your own, out dosage, your own in a little, mm. it's a little like taking medicine. How did you feel after when you got the medicine just right? You felt better, your fever went away, you, you regained health. You took too much medicine, you're a mess, you're lethargic, yeah? Or you didn't take enough, you still have bad symptoms. 
So what is the dosage? The correct dosage for you is that when you finish practice, you feel better than when you started. You have more energy after practice and feel better throughout the rest of your day. If after practice, you're like, I did my yoga, that's all I can do now is I just have to lie in bed and sleep the rest of the day, but I did advanced series. But that says we well, did too much because the goal isn't to be an asana machine. And this is stuff, you know, I'm realizing later that the goal is to practice in such a way that we increase prana in our body, then take that good juice and go out there and make the world a better place. Go out there and use that good energy and be nice to people, share a smile, help somebody open a door for somebody, you know, whatever, just all the things we can do rather than just I'm just obsessed with, I've got to get the next posture and I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to jog because my hips might get tight and then I won't get, you know, the next posture or something. You mentioned earlier that you were doing or trying to do as little as possible now, rather than doing as much as possible. So you're using short forms yourself in your practice. And if so, like, yes, I don't. What, and how, I'm not, how, would you still call it Ashtanga that you're doing then? Well, it is to me, but I will just say it's just practice. Mm. I don't, I, 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 it, it's a practice, regardless of what you want to call it. Even when you call things Ashtanga, people get upset about that. They're like, well, why do you call it Ashtanga? But Tabi Joyce once said, all yoga is Ashtanga yoga. <laughs> because ultimately, it's all Ashtanga. It, it's all Patanjali's yoga. I'm not married to, I have to do X, Y, Z today. I step onto the mat and I start to practice. Is it Patabi Joyce's original 3A, 3B? Final three? Okay, great. What if I miss a couple of days? That's okay with me also. I don't want to practice out of guilt. I want to practice out of desire to do it. And the understanding that without it, life is harder. Not out of fear that somebody told you you have to do this or have to do that if you ever notice when somebody asked me to sign a book or something i'll say have fun practicing because if you enjoyed it you'll want to do it it's not even a discipline if it's something that you take pleasure in and all of these words i've said david williams he sums it up at the beginning of workshops sometimes he'll say in his accent i now give you permission to enjoy your yoga and that's it, you know, find a way to practice mm -hmm. so that you feel good, so that you feel better. And don't listen to all the other stuff, you know, people saying you got to do this and that. Now, as I mentioned before, when I run Mysore classes, like Shelly and I will do our Mysore month of Mysore classes on Maui again this summer. I, I want people to stick with the Ashtanga sequence because I figure short forms, you can do that at home. Right. But if you're coming into this Mysore program or you're going to Mysore and studying with Sharat or something, you're going to need to stick with a sequence. Now, if you want to do half primary or whatever, but if people start mixing it in a little first, and a little second, I'm like, hey, I'm happy for you, but it's not this class. You understand? So, so when, yeah, sure. So when would they do it then? Because I mean, okay, someone comes to you in your Mysore classes and they've got 15, 20 minutes or say they've got little energy. They've got no energy They're you know, they're just a, a new mother or whatever, you know, injury or you know, an elderly. They've got little energy. They don't have 15, 20 minutes. Do you teach them a short form or do you teach them just up to, you know, sun salutations and the last three postures as you mentioned well, now, and say, well, do your short forms at home. You know? No, if, so what's the, but keep the in mind, a Mysore class is, is mostly people that already know a practice. So I'd say, oh, you've got 20 minutes. Why wow, are you really tired? Just do a couple A, couple B, start into the stand, standing and then finish when you're tired or when you got to go. Mm. Mm. I would rather them do that than go, well, today I'm going to do, you know, the first two standing and then I'm going to do a handstand and then I'll do headstand and then I'll come back and do Kapotasana. Then I'll do something else because it's something different. Now, if you want to do that at home, I'm fine with it. But it's like if you come into your piano class, yeah, and you're and, and it's to learn to play Beethoven, whatever. But you're like, no, 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 I don't play C sharp chords. I only play this or the other. Well, that's not right then to look at your teacher and go, no, I don't want to do that. It's an Ashtanga Mysore class. Your short forms, you can just do them at home and I can tell you how to create one. 
But if you're coming into this Mysore class, I would just have you do as much as you can in that little period of time. Mm. And this might be mm. paradoxical or even sound like um, sort of competing ideas that on one hand, I'm saying, do your short forms. On the other hand, I'm being this traditional person saying, when you come into a, an Ashtanga class, it is what it is. It's not called a vinyasa flow class. You know what I mean? Mm. But isn't there a principle, would you say there's principles outside the sequences themselves that give some kind of definition to Batabi's Joyce, Batabi Joyce's Ashtanga, other than just saying, well, it's a set sequence of postures. The yes, it, you know, it's but... what I call the five elements of practice. Ujjayi breathing, bandhas, drishti, vinyasa, and the sequencing, five things. When you combine all of those, that's the practice. Five elements of practice. And also, if you come into a Mysore class and you're going to do your own thing, I don't know how to help you because I don't know how that works. It's your body and you're doing your own thing. But again, if you come into a ballet class and you want to learn the Nutcracker Ballet, or it's a Nutcracker Ballet class, and you start doing hip hop because you like that better, or you don't want to wear point shoes and a tutu, you want to wear baggy pants and Doc Martin boots, well, they'll say, go somewhere else. It's choreography. The difference is being in a class or practicing on your home, at, at home. The short forms are for people who just needed a way to practice at home, that don't have time mm. to do the whole thing. And, and mm. But if you're in a class, I can guide you in a better way with these sequences that I'm so familiar with, rather than a sequence that you created, because maybe you created something that to me doesn't look like it works. How would you create? I mean, you mentioned, you know, a couple of sentences back that you could help someone create a short form. Have you got, I mean, you mentioned the families. Have you got any other words of, uh, you know, guidance for someone trying to create a short form out of the practice where they might look to? Look at the direct, them? look at that directions a body can move. Okay. Bend forward, bend back, twist to the right, twist to the left, invert, balance, uh, standing, seated. Take those categories and in each category, put a bunch of asanas. And then you can, as long as you hit all of those categories in your practice, you can create a holistic practice. You know what I mean? So if you've got some forward bending things, there should be some backward bending things. Why in Ashtanga do we jump back and do up dog, down dog after all those forward bends? Because you've got a back bend after. Right? If there's been some deep back bend, then there's a forward bend. What happens after in second series in Ashtanga after the deep back bend of Kapotasana? What's next? Bakasana. You round your back. It's a counter pose, followed by twisting poses because you're now bringing the spine back to neutral. So if you take these assets of the way a body moves, and then within each of those baskets, you put asanas, I think you could develop your own sequence and it could be holistic. There's a lot of ways to bend forward besides Padangustasana, Padahastasana or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that you could create a holistic way. And another thing is the, not just the sequencing, but there's an energetic rhythm. Each sequence of Ashtanga has a point where it builds to a crescendo of intensity and energetic output, and then it winds down. Adam, where would you say that peak is in primary series? Well, I think it's around between Navasana and um, Kamasana, right? Right. So it's Navasana. Prior to Navasana, there's all these vinyasas, right side, left side, right side, you're jumping back, and then boom, Navasana, then Buja Pidasana. What, what changes after Marichyasana? No more right side, left side. So built into the sequence is this natural building of intensity and then winding down. So there's no more right side. Things start calming down. The dynamic changes. The breath slows as we get into closing. Then you have the inversions. You wind down to the final through with really slow breathing and done. So that's the other thing is to create a pattern where there's a warm up, which are sun salutations, sun salutations, a few standing poses to warm the body up. 
you build up to an intensity, find a way to take that intensity away, start winding down as you glide toward your closing. So there's the energetic expressions in addition to the asanas themselves. You mentioned the last three postures being kind of the, the, the original short form of Patabi Joyce that you do sun salutations, then the last three postures. What's their significance? And would you always keep them in? And along those lines, just to I, qualify that question further, would you always recommend some kind of inversion like shoulder stand or headstand as well as those to, in, the, well, in the short form? I look at downward dog as an inversion, right? Downward dog is an inversion. So if you do 3A, 3B, you've got six times you're holding an inversion for those breaths. So you, you've already got an inversion in there. I think since it maybe it's just ingrained in me that you always finish with that. And it feels like a, a natural way to finish because you're, you're winding down and you end up in this Lotus, you know, pose and then blah, finish. So it makes sense to me to always finish that way. And it, it feels like I've completed it. Like I put a, a period at the end of a sentence or something, but I'm not saying that that has to be for everyone, but it, it, it's a, a pattern that I, I believe in and it, it feels natural to me. Many people would say that the Uplutihi at the end feels kind of strange that, you know, you're winding down and then Uplutihi. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I've got a lot of thoughts on that, <laughs> right. especially the way we used to do it. Now you're supposed to breathe slowly. I don't know how this will come across in the audio, but we were told to breathe like for 100 breaths. And it wasn't called Utpluti, it was called Tolasana, hmm. like a Tola, a scale. Hmm. Um, and that really made you think, why? And in my own mind, I was like, okay, why is this? We're winding down. We've got yoga mudra and then padmasana, I'm chill. And then we lift up and there's this boom, boom, boom. Well, when I spoke about the five elements early, bandhas, vishti, asana, vinyasa, et cetera, bandhas, um, mm. this is at the end of the practice. So your body is as open as it's going to be. When we lift, we are forcibly engaging the central core of the body when we lift our body from the floor. And so your, your channels are as open as you can. And then you, you get this breath and it's like, boom. and you're surcharging it and pushing it deeper into your body on a cellular level. And then you lie down bah, and you're watching your heartbeat as it's slowing down and your breath, but this energy, it's like, it's like a sponge filling with water. So your body on a cellular level is being bathed in this prana. That's how I look at it. Maybe it's just a justification, but I, in my head, I decide, well, maybe it's the most important asana because it's last. And what I started to like about it, and what's it's even more so in the way it's taught today, because when we did that hundred breath, that puts you in another mindset. This it's almost like you're like you're running up a hill or something. But as you know, Adam, today, and you know how Patabi Joyce did and Shrat will do the same thing. They start messing with you. They're only count to 10 and we're supposed to breathe really slow. So it'd be like, Lan. this is Patabi Joyce counting. Then three counting really slow. I timed it once for Patabi Joyce to get to 10 was two minutes and 47 seconds to get to 10. <laughs> And sometimes he would get to nine and just keep saying nine. So our linear brain starts to freak out. Like it's 10, it's 10. But when he starts going backwards and sideways in the count, you don't know when 10 is coming. So in my mind, you have this like Zen state. Rather than the, the linear brain had to be set aside for a moment. And because the breath is really calm, you've got to relax your face listen to your breath, keep the breath calm, even though you're in the midst of its intensity. So I found the lesson to be beautiful for life. Even in the midst of craziness and adversity, you keep a calm demeanor, you listen to your breath, your face is relaxed, even if inside you're freaking out, 
you learn to control that emotion, stay in the moment, be relaxed like you're watching the sunset, even though you're in the midst of this intense asana. That's how I look at it. Okay, that'll be very useful for many people who asked me recently about this, why this comes at the end. Um, okay, so along those lines, let's let's pick your brains for a couple of other things. Um, what about um, having Ardhavada Padmottanasana at the start? Now, as I understand, that was late. That was at the end before, and it's put and it was put in the standing postures later on. Is that correct? Um, and along those lines, I'll, I'll just qualify the question once more, um, just to get a word in here. Um, what if someone can't do a lotus, right? Do you keep them there and get them working on that posture or do you give them a modification? So I suppose that would segue to use of modifications most generally or when to get someone to struggle in the making the shape itself. Yeah. So we'll form this in two questions. The first is very few people know, but Uttita Hasta Parangasana and Ardhapada used to be in the closing sequence. Yes. Yeah. I found an old video film of me doing practice. And I saw that after Seto Bandas and I stood up and did those postures. They were there. I don't know You've when forgotten. they, when they, yes, that's right. I'd forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know when it was shifted, but it, logically it makes more sense that Ardhabada would be in the closing sequence. It's intense. Half Lotus standing on one foot, bind it, fold forward. Wow. But, you know, I'm not the creator of this, and I just followed the rules, and it became something that was in the standing. So I just went with it. Yeah, so that's all I know about that. But it was at one time in the at the end. Yeah. Um, as far as being able to sit in Lotus, I'd have to ask this question. What if someone comes to you and they have one leg? Could they never do yoga? The best they're ever going to get is half of a Lotus, right? And if, if, if yoga is all about getting a full lotus position, well, they're disqualified already. I've been a fan of giving modifications to things for years. It was the whole thing with my book was giving these options and modifications. And I received tons of criticism for that. Like people saying, you're, you're not a traditionalist, you're diluting everything. Hmm. And I revert to a, a story of, I watched Patabi Joyce teaching a quadriplegic boy in Mysore, India. He could only move his head. His family would place him on the shala floor and leave. Patabi Joyce stood over him, would place his body in the shape of an asana and have him breathe deeply. And then put his body in the shape of another asana, have him breathe deeply. He didn't say you can't do yoga. And so if someone cannot do something, the way you can get better at that thing is to do that thing. So rather than go, okay, your hips aren't open, go do these hip opener things. No, just keep trying the Lotus or do the half Lotus. And then I'll look at people and say, you know, you can live a happy, satisfying, productive life and never sit in full Lotus. And it doesn't mean just because somebody can sit in Lotus that they're somehow advanced. It looks cool. And it fits the stereotype of what a yogi is, you know, to be in Lotus and, and be sat there for days or whatever. Um, but the fact that someone's hips are tight or they can't sit in Lotus doesn't disqualify them from being an advanced yogi. Mm. And, and it creates a, a situation where students are getting injured because they're trying to per per achieve the perception of what an asana is like Murchiasana D. If you can't, have a foot and half lotus and bind, you don't go on. I go, but it's not called bada hasta marichyasana. Yeah, so get as close as you can. Use a modification. Leave that one foot down on the floor instead of half lotus. I focus on what I call integrity of practice, breath, focus, and presence. If somebody maintains that, I keep giving them asanas. When they lose the focus mm -hmm. and breath and presence, I say stop. Okay, that was my next question. Mm -hmm. Rather than, than it being based upon flexibility, because that just awards mm. people who are naturally flexible. Mm. And then it causes people get beaten, their, tearing their bodies apart because they're not naturally flexible and they're being stopped. So it creates a funny situation. Mm. What if um, someone's got kind of a certain allotted practice time a day, but maybe, you know, how would you see? 
practicing a lot as versus practicing a little have you anything to say about that and some people kind of think like i'll do a lot today and then i feel like i can't do anything i mean what's better that's you know doing three times a week full primary or six times a week a short form you know we're all individuals and people are motivated by doing different things how they live their life some people like to just pound it out really hard three days a week push and then take days off somebody else their mentality will be more like no i'm going to do 20 minutes a day five days a week in a row and take two days off so we have different personalities we're not all the same and, and so i don't think it's even healthy to try to give a formula and say everyone needs to do this mm. do the thing that works for you i will say that there's a, a natural tendency for humans that that we like to live in extremes the pendulum can swing all the way this way or all the way that way it's hard to find the middle road just like there's the 30 day yoga challenge i'm going to do 30 days every day and then maybe never do yoga again if you want to make it a yoga challenge make it the 30 year yoga challenge that's going to shift your mindset for a second i got to do 30 years maybe three days a week 20 minutes each time is better than doing six days a week, 90 minutes for a month, and then never want to do it again. Mm. So there's the, we have to understand as a teacher, also the different psyches of the students. Some you need to nudge them forward, encourage them a little others. They're, I call them the racehorses. They're like that. You don't want to squash their enthusiasm, but you also are wanting to get hurt. Right. So you're, mm. it's a bit of psychology, keeping people safe and inspired and moving um, so that they can gain the benefits from this great system. Yeah, I think you've hit upon it nicely. I mean, sa safety and inspiration, and they, the, you know, they often don't go together, or seemingly, like you know, like what is inspiring often is not necessarily naturally safe. So it's just like sort of trying to kind of find a balance between the two. Um, and, That's true. And keep yeah. someone, as you say, keep someone on the track for a lifetime, rather than them being super inspired for you know a month or two until they do themselves a serious injury, and then the most discouraging thing about you know it, to you know in terms of practice is to be injured and then you know that's the first way you're going to quit practice in life in, in, in life, life it's terrible yeah so um yeah i know um i, I know you probably won't want to answer this and i know people want to or be curious about you know hearing what you do these days you talked about having hours and beating yourself up on the mat you know in your younger years and you know having a high dose of medicine what's the kind of dose you have these days you know, how does that work out for you Every day is different. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to be, I'm not purposefully being, um, avoiding the question, but the reality is it just depends. Some days it, it's just a few minutes. I might miss a day. Other days it's a full practice. And to be honest with you, whatever my practice is should have no bearing on what your practice is. It should have, they're, they're different things. Yeah. We're all different, you know. I've been doing. I started Ashtanga what in nineteen seventy three or four. So how many years is that? Fifty years or something? Close. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it changes, but it's still part of my life. I love it. I I see it as 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 great value. But I'm not going to beat myself up if I don't practice for two days. This is a, a tool that is in my life for the rest of my life, and I'll carry on practicing it. Now, if you go to Mysore, India or something, that's all you've got to do in a day. Yeah, just do a practice because all you got to do the rest of the day is go home and sleep or sit by the pool at the Southern Star and have a veggie burger. <laughs> yeah. But if you have a life, the, the goal is to, for me, to do my practice, feel good, be a good husband, be a productive citizen in the world, try to try to be some kind of positive energy. And so whatever practice I need to do to facilitate that is what I will do. Hmm. Nicely said, well, it's not alluding to details. It's just a general nosiness that people always ask. Oh, what's David? Doing? Sure. What does David do these days? You know, people, people would love. To I will know. say <laughs> this. It is not something I would want to post on Instagram every day. going to go check <laughs> it out. Look what I'm doing. You know, wow. Ooh. You know, maybe I had those moments with all those videos and stuff, but it's a personal journey. You know, it's my own thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't feel the need to put it out there. 
you know, if, if Sherrod is traveling and teaching, I go to his classes. I just go to primary series classes and practice if he's in town, whatever. Um, but I don't really have any, my motivation doesn't come from anything other than what I need mm. on that day from this medicine cabinet. Well, I think you're doing and yourself a disservice, that, really, because when I see you doing a downward dog or anything, I, sim I have a similar feeling to the women of the of the Tai Chi in the park kind of metaphor that, you know, you can see a depth well, in, in even the simple asanas when I see you do any of them. Well, that 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 may be, I don't know, but um, it's not my motivation. Maybe it, it, it comes out in some other way, um, but I'm not the social media guy. <laughs> not, <laughs> no, I'm not really, really not, not um, good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you didn't come to age in this modern age. Um, yeah, you didn't have to. I didn't have to um, battle with the social media stuff so much. Um, so finally, I wanted to ask you, David, and again, a bit of a curious one, really. You know, you mentioned before about people kind of giving you a little bit of slack, criticizing you for the short forms. So what was the reception, you know, amongst your peers and my soil in terms of the teachers? What did people say? I'm sure you've got some stories about that. And what did Patabi Joyce say about these short forms? He must have seen them as well. Well, when I came out um, with them, with the videos in general, you know, it was mm. like, oh, people are going to criticize me. And um, I didn't have permission from Patabi Joyce. And I came up to short forms. And there was a lot of that discussion or, you know, comments, I would, should say, from sort of hardcore people that were like, oh, you know, that's not tradition. You can't do that. There were studios that banned me. They wouldn't carry my stuff because I wasn't really an Ashtanga practitioner because wow. I did this and that and the other but I took it in stride because I believed in my heart that it was the right thing to do. When I came out with my book also, I was like, um, I'm probably gonna get criticized. And I sent a copy to Patabi Joyce in India. And then I called him and I said, hey, Guruji, oh, David Swinson, what news? It was always how he would answer. And we would chat a little. He knew I was doing teacher trainings and workshops, and he would ask me how all that was going. And I, oh, all the teaching's good. I said, did you get my book? Yes. And I said, well, what do you think? He says, oh, some one by one is correct. Some one by one by one is not correct. I was like, whoa, it's like Zen. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> well, if you look at my book, you open it. On the left side is the actual asana. On the right facing page is a bunch of variations. You flip it, and then there's the next posture. But he doesn't speak English, really. And so I'm, I realized, well, he's looking, going, well, the posture there is right. And then there's all these other ones. He's Maybe he's thinking, I'm telling people, do this one, do those five variations, and then do the next one. So he's looking like going, the one by one is correct, but the one by one by one, no, it's <laughs> not correct. However, he smiled, he laughed, and a couple years later, I was at a yoga conference in New York City. Patabi Joyce was the headliner. He was the big teacher. Other Ashtanga teachers and, and students in general went to his big lead primary series class in the morning. And I, I was sat, sat in the back waiting for class. And a student walked up with my book in hand and said, David, would you sign your book? I said, ah, you know, I would, but not in this room. This, this is about Patabi Joyce. It's not about me. I'm a student just like you in here. You find me later in the day, I'll sign it. Fine, I forget about it. I come out of a workshop class that afternoon. The student comes up to me, a young woman. She has my book and a pen for me to sign. I open it to the first page where Patabi Joyce's photo is, and there's Patabi Joyce's signature, Sharat's ah. signature, and Saraswati's signature. I said, whoa. You gave him my book to sign? Yeah, he seemed really happy. He signed it. I thought, okay, I'm taking that as an authorization. So I actually photocopied that page and still have it. Um, another time I was in Mysore, and then a lot of people started coming out with books and things. I was in Mysore, and Patabi Joyce asked me and a, some other students up to his, his uh, apartment upstairs, his home. And we'd just sit around and chat. And someone had sent him a book, another student had written a book and it was sat there on the coffee table. 
and and one of the other people in the room said, oh, Guruji, what do you think of this Ashtanga book? And he looked and said, oh, David Swinson's already having. And I was like, wow, okay, I'm taking that as an authorization. So he knew what I was doing. He knew about the short mm. forms and my book and all that stuff. And we had this deep connection. And so that's what kept me going. I didn't mind. The other people's criticism didn't disturb me because I felt like mm. I had the the authorization and the love and from the person I learned it from. Mm. But he never gave you the certification in the end. Do you think that was related to this, to doing the books and stuff? Or? No, no one in the early days was certified. Right, right. It was not a thing. Patabi Joyce wasn't certified. Iyengar wasn't certified. Krishnamacharya wasn't certified. He knew I was teaching. My wife is authorized by Patabi Joyce and by Sharat level two. Um, it was something that the older David Williams, he claims to be the first because Patabi Joyce gave him a, a brass plaque of Nataraj. One hand handstand Nataraj. It's the only one I've ever seen. He said, wherever you teach, you hang this plaque. But none of the other, Nancy Gilgoff, none of us had paper. It just wasn't a thing. It wasn't necessary. It was a moot point. It became mm. a thing later. And then when it became a thing, people say, well, David, why didn't you want to get it or ask for it and go, but why? What would be different? I will say the thing you have the day that you have the paper, a certificate, is now you have something can be taken away from you. The same way that you can be certified, you can be decertified. But if someone gives you knowledge, you just have knowledge. They can't take that away. So I just felt like there was greater freedom in just being able to teach Mm. and that the greatest uh, authorization of our teaching is the quality of, of classes it creates some problems in all the systems when there's a piece of paper that says someone's qualified because maybe they are maybe they aren't I have this idea and maybe I've spoken with you about it before but I think the whole thing is backwards this teacher certification thing we should create student certification that means before beginning yoga, students understand what is the what are the qualities of a good teacher? Compassion, patience, understanding, all that stuff. Then a certified student comes into a yoga studio and pulls out their student certification card. The teacher's gonna be like, whoa, I better be good because this person <laughs> knows how to recognize a bad teacher. Mm. Now you don't need to certify mm. teachers at all. Because a certified <laughs> teacher, that piece of paper, the student is now led to believe that they're gonna be good, but maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Mm, mm. <laughs> so that's been a wonderful chat today david i know that well i know because we arranged um to host you online again for another workshop on the short forms that you shall be doing uh hopefully <laughs> if this didn't put you off a, a workshop on the short forms in a couple of weeks with us and so links will be in the uh, notes below and i uh, hope you can join us for this i think is it the f have you ever taught a short forms workshop before certainly not online this is, we can say that we're the this first is the, one online this is the first and first ever uh, in any form oh, like well i'm we, we are and, seriously privileged then and just to honor the title of the class the class is going to be seven minutes long uh, it will be a short class right so <laughs> we better be ready to give people some refunds then <laughs> no Absolutely. we'll have a, a nice class i'll lead you guys whoever comes through a a short form routine, and then we can have a little discussion about how you may be able to con construct them on your own. It'll be yeah, fun. That'll be, that'll be fantastic. I know all your workshops are incredibly fun. And this one, well, I mean, really amazing to have you on the short forms. And I think I thought you'd never done one before. So I'm really pleased no, I to have get not. you. Yeah, to get you to get you on this. And I hope everyone um, everyone plans to come and we'll see you there. Um, so thanks, David. Any parting words as we as we wrap up? Anything to say to our audience? Have fun practicing. Yeah, I knew you would say something like that. Well, oh, and, and I finally, will say, okay, yeah. Just also, just happy New Year. Best That's wishes nice for a, yeah. a a new year. Looking forward uh, for a healthy, happy year to come. Yeah. 
no possible. And I've got one question. I, I've got one question. Um, when's the book coming out? We know you've been writing this book for ages now, and I've I'm, been bugging you to. I'm, I'm, to come I'm on still and talk working about it. on it. Still, I will say it. that it's it's getting close. It really is. Okay. 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 Very is it close. in the editor's editing stage yet? You've written the whole thing. Oh, it's been written for a while. It's in probably the third or fourth edit. Okay. Right, I thought so. I had it done, and then there was another and another, and um, and of course, at one point, I had a, I may have told you I had a, a wonderful British woman helping me with the editing, until I realized that I don't really say whilst. <laughs> whilst, yeah, yeah, yeah. You so wouldn't, you wouldn't, I had um, to go back and say, I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I need to put it in as as words <laughs> that I would actually say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thou, I'm sure thou that shalt. That is, you don't use kind of like that, thou shalt <laughs> to whom, go to, to the whom store. it may concern. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, this way, very proper. And, and I realized, well, I need to right. keep this in words that would come out of my mouth, even if they're not uh, totally uh, proper English. <clears throat> that is funny. Well, anyways, keep your eyes peeled, everyone, and um, just just know that when as soon as David has this out, we're going to be strong arming him back on to talk about the book. Um, so um, thanks again, David, for coming on, and uh, we hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Well for the short forms class. So thank you again. Thank you, Adams. Best wishes to you and Teresa. Take good care.